Earlier, earlier this week, one of the biggest stories was not related to Zika at all. Actually, the CDC in the Mayo Clinic announced the discovery of a new species of bacteria called Borrelia mayonii. I hope I didn't butcher that. And it causes Lyme disease in people. Joining me now to talk about this discovery is Dr. Bobby Pritt. She is the director of Clinical Parasitology and Microbiology Laboratories and an associate professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Hello, Dr. Pritt, and welcome back to the show. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, so glad to have you back. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Okay, let's go ahead and just get a basic review of what is Lyme disease and what is the Borrelia bacterium? Sure. Well, the Borrelia bacterium that causes Lyme disease, and I should say the one that we knew about in the United States until recently, was Borrelia burgdorferi. And um, it's a spirochete, which means it's a spiral-shaped bacterium, and it's transmitted through the bite of an infected tick, uh, specifically a deer tick, which we also call Ixodes scapularis or the black-legged tick. And Lyme disease, as we all know, is a multi-system disease. It can be quite serious if you don't catch it early on. And it uh, causes this very classic bullseye or targetoid rash. It looks like a, a target. So um, the new organism that we discovered, Borrelia maonii, and you did say it right. Oh, good. <laughs> good job. <laughs> uh, is uh, closely related to that. And it also now is the second cause of Lyme disease in the United States. So kind of big news for us um, and definitely adds another layer of complexity to uh, the somewhat complicated disease of Lyme. Right. And all, an already complex situation gets a little bit more complex. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So what was the first clue for the Mayo Clinic scientists that made them think they had a new species? Well, that's a good question. We were just doing routine clinical testing, and so it was a very fortuitous discovery on our part. Um, and we had an excellent uh, laboratory technologist who was running a PCR test, uh, amplifies the DNA, looking for Borrelia burgdorferi, the known cause of Lyme disease. But the way the assay was designed, this specific test was designed, is it had flexibility to discover variants. And that's exactly what happened. We got this atypical result. It was clearly positive, but it was not exactly what we expected for Borrelia burgdorferi, the known cause of Lyme disease. So they brought it to my attention immediately. We did, we repeated it. We did a number of other tests, and we pretty early on knew we were dealing with something different. And then very quickly after that, we discovered a number of other cases. What's really interesting is all of these cases were from patients that were exposed to ticks in Minnesota or Wisconsin. Uh, okay, so now Lyme disease is essentially, it's found in a lot of states in the U.S., and the, right. CD, and the CDC estimates some 300,000 cases annually. Um, they do. It's, it's our most common tick-borne disease, actually vector-borne, vector -borne. even more common than mosquitoes, right. uh, transmitted diseases in the United States. And you, you kind of got ahead of me a little bit, but the specific geography of these patients with um, Borrelia mayonii, um, yes. that's all, it was all in the upper Midwest? It was, exactly. We had a North Dakotan resident who looked like he was exposed in Minnesota, and then all of our other patients were from Minnesota or Wisconsin, and that was their likely exposure site as well. And I take it this species of Borrelia is also transmitted via the black-legged tick? Yes. In fact, we tested 600 ticks. Uh, just black-legged ticks, and we found it in 3% of them. Uh, these were ticks that we all uh, collected uh, from Wisconsin. So looking just at ticks from the upper Midwest. And we recently did transmission studies to show that the there's no question that the black-legged tick can take up Borrelia maonii from an infected animal and then transmit it to another animal. Interesting. Okay, so yeah. here you are in your Mayo lab. And... Uh, right. What analysis did you guys do to determine that this is a different strain from Borrelia burgdorferi? Well, 
The first thing we did, like I said, was repeat it, and it clearly came back as still being positive. Um, it's always a good first step to do, just like rebooting a computer. Um, so when we knew it was still positive, we sequenced the DNA. Uh, we had amplified a very specific portion of the Borrelia DNA. Um, it's called the plasminogen binding protein. So we looked at the exact sequence of the makeup of that DNA, and it was not 100% identical to Borrelia burgdorferi. It was about 98% identical. Mm -hmm. So that 2% actually makes a large difference. Sure. That's um, enough to make us think, well, could this be something different? So then we looked at a number of other genes more than 10 other genes, actually, and we eventually sequenced the entire organism, the whole genome. So using all of those different gene analyses, we were able to show that this is clearly a different organism that's closely related but very different than Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay. Now, is there a difference in the symptoms and the severity between the two Borrelia species? You know, there does seem to be. Now, we've only had six patients so far, so I think it's important to mention that we have a lot to learn still about this organism. But first of all, five of the six patients were detected by using PCR in blood. And usually DNA tests in blood are not a good way to detect Lyme disease. Um, it's not good for Borrelia burgdorferi, but um, for Borrelia maonii, it seemed to be actually the preferred specimen. So these patients have high levels of bacteria in their blood, and they seem to have more severe symptoms. In addition to the standard symptoms like a low-grade fever, headache, body aches, and chills, uh, two of, or many of our patients had nausea and vomiting. We don't usually think of nausea and vomiting associated with Lyme disease as much. Uh, usually you'd think of like a gastrointestinal right. illness, mm -hmm. GI bug. Um, and two of our patients were hospitalized, so it was not a benign disease. Uh, fortunately, everyone has recovered, um, but that was, you know, pretty scary for those patients. Was, and then lastly, I'll mention that the rash was, uh, we had four patients with rash, but only one of them had a classic bullseye rash. The other three had very different rashes that did not look like a Lyme disease kind of rash. More diffuse, involving all the different limbs, more like spots. Dr. Pritt, let me ask you about, go back to the hospitalizations. Was this due to the acute inf infection of, uh, of this uh, type of Lyme disease? Yes, it was. it was. So it was the acute stage that uh, our two patients were hospitalized, um, and their symptoms were enough that it was concerning to their physicians that they um, chose to hospitalize them. And some of those symptoms included profound somnolence, or otherwise known as just very, very sleepy, so sleepy you could hardly arouse or wake that person up. Um, so if that's a child, I mean, that's very scary if you can't wake your kid up. Um, or uh, just uh, other symptoms in addition, so vomiting and nausea so severe that you can't keep fluids down and there's dehydration. Sure. So there could be a number of reasons why they were ultimately hospitalized. Now, going to diagnostic testing and, and what the average physician, the average laboratory is going to be doing, can the standard laboratory testing pick up this new species? Well, the good news in general is yes, but there's a couple caveats, and that is that usually in early disease, we actually look more towards the clinical presentation. 70 to 80 percent of uh, people with standard Lyme disease will have a bullseye rash. It's called erythema migrans. And if you see that and you go to your physician and you're in the right area where it's endemic to Lyme, you'll just be treated for Lyme disease. That's because the normal test that we use to detect Lyme disease is serology, and in those first three days or so, you're probably not going to have detectable antibodies. So why is that important now? Well, if you have a patient who doesn't have that classic targetoid rash and they come to their doctors, they may not get treatment for Lyme. But if you test them by serology, it's going to be negative because that's just what we would expect. Now, if you wait after that acute stage, after the first few days, then the tests do become positive just like they would for Borrelia burgdorferi, the known cause of Lyme disease. Okay. So my answer is the tests do work, but you have to wait, obviously, until antibodies are formed until sure. you can detect the response. And again, going back to what physicians would be doing, um, is the treatment similar um, as Lyme caused by um, Borrelia burgdorferi? 
Yes. From what we can tell, the treatment is similar. Uh, all of our patients did respond to antibiotics. We had one patient who had arthritis and joint inflammation, and that patient is still experiencing symptoms. Um, so that patient didn't re- get a full recovery, and unfortunately, that's very common with Lyme disease right. where you have lingering symptoms after treatment. Now, are the, the other five uh, patients made a full recovery. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> now, physicians, are the physicians in the upper Midwest being advised to be on the look for this new pathogen? Yes. We are trying to get the word out in many different ways. I've been working with the CDC and the state health departments because um, what I had mentioned about that the symptoms might be slightly different, that's important for our, our physicians to know. Uh, they need to I guess, have a broader differential when they think of Lyme disease. Uh, They also need to know that serologic testing might not be positive in the first few days. And what I didn't mention before, but I should mention, is the test we use to detect this, PCR, that actually is now the preferred method for detecting Borrelia maonii during acute illness because that will be positive in the early stage before antibodies are formed. And that's a complete departure from what we've said and what the CDC has recommended in the past, Mm -hmm. where we don't recommend PCR, but for this specific organism, we are. Okay. Now, let me just go ahead and close with this. Prevention remains the same, avoiding tick bites. That's basically it, right? Right. Yes. Okay. (laughs) All right. (laughs) <laughs> That's the last thing I always, well, it's it's one of the most important things, and I always end with this, is that ticks can transmit a lot of different diseases. And so if you're going outdoors, wherever you are, if there are, if you have ticks in the area, you need to take precautions against them. Very good. Dr. Bobby Pritt, uh, thank you, ma'am, for your time and expertise, and congratulations. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, you bet.